She says that she tells her students, just that you know, Dr. Joanne uh, Tull is the University of the West Indies Lecturer in Cultural Industries Development and uh, Management. She's also a researcher, a writer, a consultant, um, among many other things, um, and I know all good. So we continue talking about this area of the product of Carnival. By the way, listeners, that's where we're heading to. We we're going into that whole question of diversification. We're going to come to the economics of Carnival. We're giving you what we like to do in branches to give context. And if we have context, then we can sail and, and, and go on after that. Quantum leaping does not leave anybody with a clear understanding. It just says that you touched the topic. We try not to do that. Please go ahead. Yes. So that you have a scenario where you have a carnival that comprises of various components. Um, some that are more, um, more lend to the traditional arts and craft of carnival, which... I believe will always be important. Mm -hmm. Most people who are in the more modern or commercial side, what we call the contemporary mass, would have had some experience in terms of training and development on the traditional side. Across the board for the arts and culture, if you don't have that foundational training in what is known as the arts, mm -hmm. you are not likely to be sustainable. Even in music, if you look at some of the biggest artists, it's either that they were trained in singing or they, they know an instrument. There's always something there. Um, and so it's no different for the carnival. So it, there is that. Within the commercial side, or, or what we, we call the contemporary side, it becomes quite fluid in the sense that there are those who are, as you say, they're into more offering a product of experience or a service of experience. And so the dental floss thing, I remember one band, I don't know if they still have this tag and I'm not going to call the name, but I remember them once saying that we sell an experience. The, the, the costume is just the side thing. Mm. I mean, mm. it wasn't much of a costume, but you know, <laughs> it's a side thing. And their, their whole thing is that when you give them those dollars, they are about giving you this most wonderful experience um, for two days on the road. Coming down from them, which may be considered an extreme um, you have those that would give some attention to the thematics who will have their own rituals still, even though they are considered a contemporary mass bar, like the Trini Revelers and the Legacies and what have you. Mm -hmm. And then as we go further down, as you come into these smaller bands, medium size and small size, and I suppose I can add inside their K2K Alliance, um, you would have bands who are not necessarily focused totally on um, the dental floss, so to speak, but they will offer that inside there mm -hmm. it, as a means of attracting a younger market and as well as showing that they can move from one end of the spectrum to the next in terms of what they showcase. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is mass. Mm -hmm. One would see a similar pattern even in the music. I think if we listen to Soka now, you have Soka that <coughs> may sound a little bit like what you had in the past from the, the shadows and what have you. There's a rhythm out right now. I'm not sure whose rhythm it is, but there's one with that kind of sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you will have those that have a kind of EDM mix, right, um, which is very popular amongst the younger demographic. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in the mix there, there's the groovy soak a lot that tends to sound a bit popish depending on how the music is mixed and what have you. So again, it's the same thing where you have that fluidity across the board in terms of, of what the mass offers. If you look at Pan, it's there as well. Mm -hmm. Just the, the semifinals alone, I think, is an example of that. You had before North Stand, Grand Stand, and everybody went to North. Now you have North Stand, Grand Stand, Greens. Nothing, nothing and, and is Greens, static. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe people need to appreciate that about the, the, the carnival as as not just an industry, but as a phenomenon. That's laying our backdrop right. on that. Very often we speak, and, and, and this is, uh, like I said, the thrust of our discussion this morning, of the, uh, the, the economics of carnival. Carnival, then, you would call a, cult, a, a part of cultural tourism, am I correct? Yes, okay. carnival is part of cultural tourism. Cultural and tourism. And Tobago has a range of products and services that fall into cultural tourism. There's film, there's fashion, there's music. But carnival is one of the major companies. The preeminent, uh, right? All right, so talking about that, if you had to deal with this as a product, there are some prerequisites to every business. 
a prereq to having uh, cultural uh, tourism is that you must have statistics, you must have data. It is generally uh, touted, uh, oft repeated, that Carnival is the second biggest foreign exchange earner. That may be so, but here is the problem. How do you prove that? Where is the information for that? I would assume, and I will uh, um, uh, acquiesce to your knowledge, I would assume that absent that, we are only talking in the wind. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. It's actually a research area of mine right now. Um, the idea of measuring in the Caribbean has always been a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is something within us where we find it difficult to account for ourselves and to give accountability. And I am saying that quite plainly. Mm -hmm. We have a serious problem with that. In addition to which, when it comes to the arts and culture, you're going into an even greater domain. I'll give you an experience that I have had, which remains the case for most of the Caribbean. You have two camps of persons who will be interested in measuring culture, mm -hmm. whether it's carnival or another aspect. You will have the stakeholders themselves, and then the officers who will be charged with the responsibility of propelling the culture or the carnival, whether that be an NCC or Ministry of Culture, they will have that in interest. Mm -hmm. Usually across the Caribbean, Persons who work in that domain, while they will have that interest, they may not have the capacity to do that measuring. Mm -hmm. Then you have on the other hand now, those who will have the skills to do the measuring. Those are the persons who work in the, the bureaus of statistics and the ministry of statistics. Whilst they will have the skills, they do not measure culture. They don't see it as important. And the reason why they don't often see it as, a, as important is if they, because they are not mandated mm. to do the measuring. The only way we can have measuring of culture is if the ministries, whether it be planning or trade or culture, say to the CSO, for example, you need to measure this. Mm -hmm. We need to have a sense of what this is worth. Of course, somebody must um, recognize that right? we need a now this, is, now, this is a global, yes, this is a global phenomenon. I think people mm -hmm. will be shocked to know. Some very recent research that I did for the for UNESCO Institute of Statistics, and it's, it's actually up on their website now, mm -hmm. where they asked me to do a global survey of, of festivals in terms of measuring festivals. And myself and my, my research assistant um, at the time, were shocked to discover that all across the world mm -hmm. there was this void, this gap in how one goes about measuring festivals. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not to say because that's the global problem, well, then we're okay. Trinidad and Tobago had an even greater problem in the sense that Trinidad and Tobago used to measure the carnival. Mm -hmm. There is something that was called the Carnival Bulletin. And it came out, I think the last one might have been 2005, quite possibly. I know I pulled data from it up to 2004. Mm. And that bulletin used to come out about a month after the carnival. That information is included in a report that you yourself submitted That's to, correct. to the ministry. Yes, okay. Correct, <laughs> correct, correct. And that was a wonderful bulletin in the sense that it gave you a sense every year quite clearly of the number of visitors that you got, um, the period of time that they were here, um, what they spent, um, and in what areas. So, for example, the last official data, as far as I know, that would have been documented um, from CSO, at least that I got, mm -hmm. would have been in 2004. And in that, that report, the report said in 2004, Trinidad and Tobago had 40,455 visitors mm -hmm. for Carnival. And these people spent $42.5 million on accommodation and guest houses. This is accommodation and guest houses. Only. Only. Mm -hmm. And what that This is 42 million TT dollars, yes? 42 million TT Good. dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is in 2004, mm -hmm. right? This is some 10 years ago. And total, in total, that 40,000 visitors spent $173.1 million dollars in total mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. time that they were mm -hmm. here and that time mm -hmm. is normally counted somewhere between a week to two weeks and the biggest amount of money of course went to entertainment yes they spent about 69 percent on average on entertainment a rental car business with a fleet of 500 cars at that time could have made easily for the carnival weekend alone 
$955,000 for the weekend from Carnival Thursday to Ash Wednesday. That's 10 years ago. Yes, yes. So the fact is, you are correct when you say that the measuring is important. I always say measuring is knowing.